All right, so today what we're going to do is <laughs> literally exactly what it says on the screen. Um, we're going to go through the basic things that operating systems often include in their implementations as far as their capabilities are concerned. And then we'll also start doing a dive into how Unix file I.O. works because that's a good illustration of some of the things that OSs have to think about and be careful about. And it'll also help you a lot with writing the command shell with redirection. So those are the things that we're going to really spend time focusing on today. Um, usually when you see people discuss operating systems, you'll see them talk about these various aspects um, of the world that OSs live in. So you have users, and then underneath users are applications, and underneath applications are the operating system, and then obviously underneath the OS is computer hardware. And so those are the four main components that you typically um, have in these systems. So user, they just want to use a computer to do something. Maybe it's to play computer games, maybe it's uh, to take photos if it happens to be an operating system running for a digital camera, something like that. So they have a problem that they'd like to solve using computer hardware. And it's interesting because even at this level you see a wide range of behaviors in operating systems. So you'll have some that are single user OS's. Windows was that way for a really long time. Uh, you may support many concurrent users. Unix has been that way for a very long time. Um, you may even have situations, I think I mentioned this, uh, where you have no users most of the time. And uh, there are certainly computers that are for monitoring, um, like you would, like an airplane black box to never need a user, right? Um, as long as uh, everything is going well. So you might have uh, computers in those situations, very limited, uh, you know, things that they're responsible for, and as far as user support, it would be very limited, very minimal. Okay. So that's users. Then you have applications, which are used to solve the problems, and obviously those applications, they have to provide some interface for users, and they also have to interact with the OS. They expect the OS to do certain things for the application. And so this is actually a really interesting area because you'll notice here that some of the applications are actually provided by the operating system. So I have the box operating system, and there's actually stuff outside of that box that's also important and actually really critical for the operating system to work properly. We have various services, for example, um, managing things like internet connections. Maybe you're familiar with XINET-D, which when somebody connects to your computer, XINET-D is responsible for figuring out what should handle that connection. Should it be the web server? Should it be the email server? What should it be? Uh, command shells, very common example. You kind of really need a command shell if you're going to have a useful computer so that you can do various maintenance administration operations. And then even things like uh, the X11 server. If you're on a Unix system that has a graphical interface, typically that's implemented as an X server. Not on all of them, obviously Macs are a little bit different. But uh, you, know, you have these various things that are provided, and so those will be sort of part of system applications that are provided as part of the OS. Then you have user applications, which either talk directly to the OS, or they may interact with some of these system applications as well. Uh, there's many a uh, tool that has been implemented using shell scripting, or that talks to <coughs> the X server or so forth to display graphics. And so um, the user applications tend to be focused on a specific problem. So I need a text editor, I need Vim. I need a debugger, I need a compiler, those kinds of things. All right, so that's pretty straightforward. I don't think any of this is going to be crazy rocket science. Now we get to the OS. A lot of things can be implemented inside of an OS. And what we're going to do today is talk about just about every kind of facility you might see in an OS, although most of the time you won't see all of them. Um, the most obvious one is some kind of means for executing programs. I have to be able to load a program, run it, things like, you know, somebody double click the icon and now I need to start Excel or I need to start the web browser. So that is a crucial part of the operating system implementation. Now, depending on the characteristics of the OS, you may have various facilities that are also part of this operation. Um, one of the most common nowadays is some kind of runtime linking. Okay? In fact, like Max depend on this solely. But you'll have a program, and it'll just say, I need these libraries. And so when the person runs the program, 
The OS loads that into memory, and then it says, oh, you need these libraries, and it loads those as well into the same process address space, and then it starts tying the code together so that the program, when it calls functions, they'll automatically be called correctly. So that's really important. Um, like I said, that's becoming increasingly common. Back when I was an undergrad, dynamic linking was not quite so common. Uh, program termination, obviously, that's a really important one as well. We need to be able to handle program termination correctly and then other kinds of mechanisms. Signals, it's funny because signals does feature prominently here just in case a program crashes or something like that, but signals also will appear at a subsequent point in the discussion. Okay, so that's program execution. Uh, we also have resource allocation. Now, it's funny to me because last time when we were talking about what does an operating system do, I heard a lot of people say, oh, you know, I need memory, or I need a file, or I need to do this kind of stuff. Those are certainly resources that are managed by the OS. But there's other ones as well. And one of the most interesting ones is actually the CPUs, the processors in the system. Because okay? remember that the OS has a responsibility to make sure that all the running programs have time on the CPU. So that's something that the uh, OS has to manage properly. That's one of the resources. In fact, the first Pintos lab is figure out how to manage this CPU resource. Um, <coughs> other ones you can imagine, peripherals, things like printers, optical drives, things like that. Obviously, all of those things are resources that need to be managed by the OS. Okay, let's see. File systems, another <laughs> very common feature in operating systems is some kind of file system implementation. And like I was mentioning before, most OSs will typically support more than one. Like you may have three, I would say probably on the order of three uh, file systems that are generally going to be supported. Because you're going to have one for your main storage, for programs and so forth. Uh, a lot of times if you support some kind of flash storage, you'll have a fat file system implementation. And then you may have a third one for optical devices. Okay. So it's pretty common that you'll have those kinds of file systems. And then... Uh, many support many others besides that, so uh, it tends to be that there are ways of extending that. Okay. Any questions so far? These are sort of like minimal basic ones. Okay. Now obviously if we have file systems, then we have devices we have to talk to, and so typically there will be some subsystem in the OS that's responsible for talking to computer hardware. It turns out that hardware can be really baroque and really complicated to talk to, and a lot of times, um, you not only have interactions with I.O. ports, you know, or memory mapped I.O. where you're writing to addresses and that's actually going to peripheral. I talk about that here. There tend to be timing issues associated with that. Like you send a command, you wait a certain amount of time, then you send data. You'll have those kinds of interactions with hardware. A lot of times you also have interrupt-based interaction as well. And I can tell you that the x86 uh, programmable interrupt controller, the, the APIC, um, not the ones you guys will have to deal with in the uh, second assignment, but the advanced programmable interrupt controller is really complicated and really annoying to interact with. So um, typically the OS will have some <coughs> capabilities for interacting with all of these hardware components. And this is where device drivers become really useful. You've, I'm sure, heard of device drivers. The whole idea behind a device driver is to allow the OS to have some standardized interface, like all block devices, all storage devices, require this kind of interface. And then the device driver bridges the gap between that general interface and the specific hardware. Here's how to initialize it. Here's how to reset it. Here's how to format it. Here's how to pull data out of it, and so forth. Same thing with communication devices. Okay? So device drivers having, you know, anytime you have a complicated problem, you always try to find the common uh, interface and then specify that formally, and then you can have pieces of software implement it and it makes your life a lot easier. Let's see, communication. This is the other place where signals may also make an appearance. Um, operating systems, again, being the trusted intermediary between processes and between processes and hardware, frequently have to support various kinds of inter-process communication and also network communication. Those are two different kinds of communication you frequently see. Um, basically, it's really nice to support collaboration between processes. Many programs are built to, um, to actually be implemented with multiple processes. And since I love databases, Postgres is a great example of this. Postgres is implemented to have multiple processes. You have one 
that's always in charge of incoming connections, and then for every established connection, you'll have another process spawned off, and they actually communicate through shared memory, and they monitor each other in various ways. So that's inter-process communication. Very neat thing. If you get it uh, more heavily into systems programming, let me know, because there's actually really good books about IPC, and uh, there's some really powerful techniques. Okay. Uh, there's so much more I'd love to say about it. But, oh, the one thing that I will add to this is that signals probably should appear in here because signals can be used as an IPC mechanism as well. Not for communicating state so much, uh, but definitely for um, communicating state changes. And then, of course, you have networking. <coughs> and I think everybody here is familiar with networking, but, uh, you know, if you have a mechanism that is generic and has some generic API, then... It's kind of neat. You can actually build programs where you don't care if the process is local on the same computer or if it's on another computer. And if you build a system like that, then you can actually create a single generic system that's able to use both of these mechanisms. And so it's agnostic as far as whether or not processes are on the same machine or not. Again, you can build some very powerful systems that way. Accounting. So um, there are situations where you want to be able to keep track of what processors are doing for various purposes. And usually the number one purpose is so that you can bill <laughs> people for using a computer. So um, that's where accounting can really come in helpful. Um, it used to be, you know, when you had big mainframes and when you had um, uh, mini computers as well, that you would bill for CPU time. So each department would have a certain budget for using a computer. And, you know, the department's people would run programs on the mainframe, and then they'd get a bill for how much time they actually used on the mainframe. Okay? Now we don't do that, because it kind of is like, we'd rather, we want to compute things so fast, we'd rather you just say, well, we're going to allocate you a processor. You can go ahead and use a processor as much as you want, but what we will bill you for is storage and networking. Okay? Like anybody who's used a cloud-based uh, solution for computing is probably familiar with it. So accounting, very, very common feature. You want it to be reliable and accurate and efficient, all of those things. Error detection. So <laughs> this is really key. And it's funny because this will actually vary pretty widely depending on the characteristics of the hardware. What is the hardware actually capable of detecting as far as errors are concerned? Okay. There's some obvious ones. I ran out of space on my storage device. I can no longer do virtual memory management because I ran out of space. I can't swap out or something like that. That would be bad. So that's an example of an error. Um, your printer is out of paper. Another obvious common one. These are all the kinds of things that an OS has to be able to <coughs> report or handle in some graceful way. Okay, let me see. I have some information about this. Yeah. So let's see, yeah, hard disk is broken. That's one that you certainly don't want to run into. Uh, memory errors typically uh, will be reported as uh, blue screen or kernel panic, some kind of thing like that. Typically, they're called mach machine checks on, on uh, most hardware because it's like you really need to go look at your physical machine because it's broken. Okay. So there's various uh, errors like this. There's a few less common ones, which I think are really interesting. Um, there was a company called Tandem. And the reason it was called Tandem is because they would make these processors. They were called lockstep processors. And they would actually run with two cores. And these processors <laughs> were designed to be used in really crucial computing environments, like medical computing or ATMs, things like that, where you want to make sure the computer is never wrong. And so the two processors would actually run every instruction in lockstep. And if the answers ever didn't match, you'd get a fault. And the processor would either try to roll back and rerun the instruction again, or you could get the OS involved as well. And the reason why I think that's particularly interesting is because now that we all have these, like, I don't know how many cores this stupid phone has, um, but probably a lot of you have devices with multiple cores now. And some of the ARM processors with multiple cores have a lockstep mode so that you can run them and say, I'd like to build a device that can actually verify that its computations are correct. So depending on what the hardware can support, the OS can get quite sophisticated about the errors it can detect. Okay, yeah, things like that. Um, finally, you have protection and security. And this is where the OS has to be very careful to 
watch out for either just uh, intentionally badly behaved programs or perhaps accidentally badly behaved programs. So the OS has to be careful about that. One of the mechanisms that we use to protect the OS from applications is by not allowing applications to, to directly access system code, system data. I think that just makes sense. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever used DOS. Has anybody here used DOS? Yeah, see, this is like 2017, right? Um, I grew up on DOS, and one of the things I loved about DOS is that it had no protection at all. You could do anything you wanted to that OS, and we abused it in all kinds of ways. It was just really fun. But um, nowadays, everybody runs protected mode OSs where you're not allowed to do that. Okay? So this is something that the computer hardware has to provide, but part of that mechanism is that the OS has a boundary called the system call mechanism, and all of the interactions with the OS have to go through this system call mechanism. So that prevents applications from directly accessing you know, operating system internal storage or code. That was Riley. That's right, he just moved back to California, uh, back to LA after that. Anyway, sorry, that's a non sequitur. But anyway, so you have this, this constraint that all of the interactions with the OS go through the system call. Okay, any questions so far? You can see this is quite a broad set of facilities that an OS can provide. A lot of times we don't have all of these things. Like Linux doesn't really have very good accounting or auditing capabilities. Windows certainly doesn't have uh, particularly good auditing capabilities, although you can build some of these things in. But yeah, I mean, they're all pretty fully featured, actually, if you look at it. Okay, let's see. Yeah, op operating system also has to protect processes from each other. This is the kind of thing we talk about quite a bit in CS24, and we'll talk about it more in 124, is the whole notion of how do you protect processes from each other. We need some kind of isolation mechanism between processes. So basically, we only allow processes to cooperate if both sides agree to. That's the requirement. Both sides have to agree to it if we're actually going to allow them to interact. All right, now um, we are going to talk a lot of, and I think unfortunately this, this is part of the uh, lectures that I'm going to be gone for, but we do have good recordings of those lectures, so you can uh, simply look at the recordings to get the details. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about what hardware facilities are required to build a modern operating system. And there's really only two that we care about at this point. There's going to be a third one that shows up pretty shortly, but we're not going to talk about it today. But there's two main things that we really need to build a solid, reliable operating system. Okay? First one is operating modes. Okay? Again, you've, you've all seen this before. We talk about it in CS24. But we need to have some way of physically enforcing different sets of capabilities for different programs. And we have to have a way of enforcing that. Okay? Minimal requirement is that we have some kernel mode or protected mode or privileged mode, and that's where you can do either a lot of or all of the things that the processor actually supports. The other, um, other mode that we need to support is some kind of restricted mode, which we typically call user mode, and that's where applications run. So they're not allowed to manipulate the hardware in the same way that you can in kernel mode. And as long as we have that distinction and the processor isn't buggy or something like that, we can actually build a reliable operating system. So, um, this presents the um, seemingly exciting question, but it turns out to not be as exciting as you might think. What is the operating system kernel? Well, it's just that part of the OS that runs in kernel mode. That's all it is. Okay? So you might think, oh, there's some like amazing, and there actually are some really interesting uh, thoughts and discussions about what should be in a kernel. But really fundamentally, when it comes down to it, the kernel is just the part of the OS that runs in kernel mode. There may be a lot of things running in user mode, depending, like if you have a microkernel architecture, you'll have most of your OS running in user mode. If you're something like Linux, more monolithic kernel, you're going to have most of the OS is actually running in uh, kernel mode. <coughs> okay, let's see. Yeah, some processors do provide more than two operating modes. This is just, you see this a lot these days. This is an example of how x86 does it. Um, IA32 or x86-64, we have four operating 
modes. Typically, we only use ring zero and ring three. Okay, and that's what we'll do in Pintos. That's what Linux does, and uh, that's what Windows did. I mean, this has been the way that it's worked for a long time until we started having more virtual machines running with OSs, guest OSs inside of them. Because a lot of times, the guest OS will actually run in ring one, not in ring zero. Okay? So that's kind of the only distinction that we have now. But uh, you really only need two modes to make this happen. Okay. ARM, you know, the uh, Advanced Risk Machines, that's what ARM stands for. Uh, processors are used in a lot of different smartphones. And I've mentioned this before, if you think about all the modes that your phone can be in. I'm in a phone call, or I'm not in a phone call. The device is, like right now, my device is not off, but it's hibernating, or I can turn it off. So you have all these different operating modes that the processor supports so that you can um, have different pieces of software doing different things with different capabilities in each of these operating modes. So um, you see processors now with quite a few different protection levels. Okay. Uh, any questions? Okay, so that's one facility that we need. The other facility that we really need from the computer hardware is some kind of virtual memory management. So just some way of mapping virtual addresses to physical addresses so that the view of memory that the process has is different from the actual physical view of memory that the kernel has or that the hardware has. Okay? And so again, this is a picture that we have from CS24. This is one way that memory management is done. It turns out to be the way that it's done nowadays. It's not the only way that it's been done historically. But you have a memory management unit. It receives virtual addresses, which are the only kinds of addresses that programs know how to use. And then they are translated through a translation mechanism that causes the CPU to emit physical addresses. And so that way we can have processes that cannot see each other's memory. They are physically constrained again so that they cannot see each other's memory. Okay. So those are the two features that we really need so far. Let's see, yeah, we'll discuss that a lot in the future. Now, with this mechanism, the OS can say, processes are going to see memory in this form, in general. You, lay, you, you figure out a general memory layout pattern, and that becomes what processes see. And um, that actually is given a name. It's called the Application Binary Interface. It's something that's part of the OS spec. Where should processes expect things to live? And this becomes really important because then the compiler can say, well, I've got to make sure that the emitted binary code starts at a particular address. And that way, the memory heap can live at some other address, and, and shared libraries will live at another address. So this is pretty important that the OS specify these things in some clear, coherent way so that uh, applications can rely on it. Okay? So um, one thing you may notice about the memory layout that I have in this picture, especially if you took CS24 last year. Last year we've switched to 64-bit. And one of the things about 64-bit is that the address space changed. Okay, so they don't use the same address uh, specific layout, I should say, in 64-bit and 32-bit. So this is the 32-bit process address layout for Linux. It also happens to be the one that we'll be using for Pintos. That makes it really easy to compile for Pintos. You just compile for Linux, and then you can just uh, run the program in Pintos. Okay? But uh, you can see the various addresses. 4 gig address space, 3 gigs are allocated to the user application, and then the top gig is for the kernel to use in whatever way it sees fit. Okay? Let's see. Yeah, and so we can specify constraints on how different regions of memory can be accessed. Can you access this memory from user mode? Must you access this from kernel mode and so forth? And again, the hardware will enforce this so that processes can't just overrun that. And so we can actually have regions of memory that are used by the application. Now the kernel can access it too, but the part that's uh, devoted to the application is called user space. And then the part that can only be accessed from kernel mode is called kernel space. So that's what we're seeing here. Uh, if user mode code tries to access kernel space, you get a fault. And typically it means that the program was trying to do something naughty and it tends to be terminated by the uh, kernel. Okay, any questions about all this? We'll be seeing this a lot. Like, you don't really need to start worrying about this until 
Um, project four, I think, is where you start running into this with the system call mechanism. I think that's the first place you need user mode anyway. Okay, now there are details that the OS keeps track of for each process. Like I say here, the memory map, we talk about a lot of this in CS24, so I don't feel a big need to actually talk about this. Um, we'll be picking up all of this detail as we go through the course. Um, but the main thing that I want to convey today is that the process can't be trusted to just access this information directly and manipulate it directly because this is operating system data. If a process mangles it, does it incorrectly, then it can mess things up for everybody. Okay? Just like I was saying with DOS, like you could go in and change the uh, data structures for managing system memory. And you could have fun, you could do some clever things, but you could also make a mess for everybody else. Okay? The OS, we shouldn't allow that if we want to have a nice reliable OS. So basically what happens is the process has to ask the kernel to do things on its behalf. And this goes through the system call mechanism. Okay. And what we're going to talk about today is how that works with files. Okay. So you run a program, and probably in CS1 you took this for granted, CS2 you took this for granted, you run it, the OS sets up certain capabilities or certain facilities for that program to run. Okay. And the most obvious ones are standard input, I want to be able to type on the console and my program gets the data, standard output, my program belches out results and those somehow need to go somewhere. And then standard error if you happen to be sophisticated and want to say something bad happened. Okay. So these streams can come from where? Well we already talked about one, right? I type on the keyboard so that's called a console. You type on it and your program gets the information. That's one place. What's another place? Yeah, reading or writing a file would be another one. What, what's another one? Turns out there's a third one. Yeah. Yeah, you could chain processes together, which is really cool. Like, uh, I don't know if any of you have done that kind of thing. You'll be doing that a lot by the end of this term. Um, but you can run one program and say, you know what? I don't want to create a temporary file and then pipe that file into another program. I'd rather just take the output of this program and make it the input of the next. So you can construct sophisticated commands. And one of the nice things about Unix is that they have all these little utilities that are typically in slash bin or user bin or whatever. And they're all designed in the same way. Take inputs, arguments control, how they operate, spit out outputs. And then you can do very sophisticated things just chaining together a bunch of commands and they communicate through pipes. Okay? So you write this program, it always communicates through standard in and standard out. And then it's able to use all of these various things. Okay? So console, redirected to or from disk files. Okay? So it's as if the disk file was being typed into the program. And then also redirecting between processes. Okay? Now the way that all I.O. is done, I already mentioned this last time, but you have read and write. Very simple operations, um, at least after a while, they'll become very simple. You'll be like, oh yeah, this is, this is easy stuff. So um, you take this file that's thing, which we'll talk about in a second, and a buffer that you want to read into, and how many bytes you'd like to read. Okay? And then it gives you back an answer. Same thing with write. Here's something just uh, describing what file I want to write to. Here's a buffer of data I want to write, and how many bytes are in that buffer. And so these operations try to read or try to write a particular file. <coughs> and um, you'll notice that they take a size t. So size t is unsigned, s size t is signed, and the reason why it's signed is because error codes are negative. Okay? So it'll either be zero or positive if everything was okay, or it'll be negative if it's time to freak out or crash. Okay? So um, pretty straightforward. But these are used for all different kinds of things you could interact with. They're used for files, they're used for the console, they're used for pipes, they're used for sockets. And so basically since all of them provide this one set of APIs, as long as your program uses these, and that's what printf and scanf use, you can have those things take input and push output to all of these different things. Okay? So these operations are basically the user program is requesting the kernel to do them on its behalf. 
Okay. And like I said, they tend to take a, a long time. Now, if these take a long time, I'm telling you they take a long time, what happens when you call read or what happens when you call write? You have to start thinking like an OS programmer in this class. Yeah. Context switch, yes. Exactly. So that tends to be what happens. All right. File this. What is this file this thing? I usually call it FD because um, it's less typing. But um, since we're trying to explain what these things are, we'll have a more descriptive name. File descriptor is just a non-negative integer specifying which file you're interacting with. Okay. Obviously, since we're not in the Stone Ages, we can have multiple files open in our programs. And so uh, we have to have a way of managing those, those various files. The way that the OS does this is it'll have an array or some data structure equivalent to an array, so some indexed data structure. And it'll have in that array a record of which files are open by that process. So I bet you can guess immediately what the file des value is. Just an index into this array. That's all it is. Super easy. Okay. So those elements, at least for open files, those elements will point to some OS <laughs> internal data structure that says, here's the file that's open. You'll notice it may have flags. So, um, And I should probably back up and say uh, momentarily, this is representative. Not all OSs are implemented exactly this way. Some manage their open files slightly differently. And obviously, there's a wide range in what values are kept track of for a particular open file. So that's the caveat out of the way. Um, but this is definitely very representative. So flags like, did you open it read-write? Did you open it read-only? Are you even allowing writes to this file? Did you truncate it? Um, should I always append when I write to it? Those kinds of things go into these data structures. Also, you have a current file offset if you read or write, where you're reading or writing from. And then this weird V pointer thing that we'll talk about in a second. Okay? So, but that's what those array elements will reference. Okay. The other thing that I would mention here is that there is definitely a limit to how many open files a process can have. Has anybody run into that? Like you were writing a program and you ran into the limit of how many open files you can have? Mac used to have a really low limit. It used to be like 20 files that a process could have open. And I wrote this program that would open like 40,000 sockets at once. And it ran into that limit pretty fast, as you can imagine. Thankfully, you can, you can uh, override that. There's system calls, and there's a utility that will uh, invoke those system calls for you called ULimit. ULimit you can use to change various limits on your processes. If you want a bigger stack, what, what would you like? Okay. So anyway, we have a cap on the total number of open files. It's kind of like a limit on stack size. Well, maybe you're doing it wrong if you hit that limit. Okay. And so processes have this array, but they're not allowed to access it directly. That would be bad. You notice on read, write, you specify here's the file descriptor, and the kernel takes care of it for you. Okay. So this is how the kernel hooks things up. Okay. So you've got this array of files that are currently open. Each one of those things points to some details that pertain to that open file. And then they also have this reference to some more complex data structure that describes a lot more detail about the file itself. Okay. And the thing that I want to point out to you that's really neat about this is that data structure that's referenced not only contains information about the file, but it also contains operations. It's kind of like a C version of an object. It'll contain function pointers, things like that. And this allows the kernel to support many different kinds of files through just one uh, interface. Okay? So the file ops thing. You can see that is the, the first field in that, that data structure. Then I'll have some function pointers in it. And you'll notice it'll have one called read. And read's uh, signature corresponds very closely to the read system call. Okay. Instead of taking a file descriptor, we don't need a file descriptor at this point because we have the file star for it. But it also takes a, bu a buffer in its size, and it returns back the result that we may want to uh, phone call. Um, that we may want to return back to the, the uh, user in user space. Okay. Same thing with write. 
We don't need a file descriptor because we already have the file star, but we need the buffer of data to write and the number of bytes to write. Okay, so file operation, you can see it'll have an array of function pointers. Now this is how the kernel would implement something like this. It goes and it looks up the file descriptor. We're leaving out error checking, by the way. So it's possible that the file descriptor is not an open file. It's possible the file descriptor is negative or out of range or something like that. So we do our due diligence. We look up the file star, and then we use that thing to find the specific implementation of read we want, or the specific implementation of write that we want. OK, everybody got that? So we can do this for sockets. We can do this for files. We can do this for pipes. We can do it for the console. Very easy. OK, any questions? Sweet. Thankfully, you won't have to do anything like this <laughs> again until, I think, project four, um, because you probably won't be passing function pointers around unless you're doing something really sophisticated or really naughty. So um, you won't have to deal with this. But this is how this works. OK, um, so this is basically where things live. This is all kernel data. So this is all going to be in kernel space. But you can see that some of it is associated with a specific process, and some of it is global. We don't have that big data structure corresponding to the file duplicated per process, because that would be expensive. But the parts of it that each process cares about, like its current offset, the read and write flags or other flags that govern the opening of the file, those things are per process. So you can see how the kernel has to figure this layout out. Okay? And that's why two processes can be at different positions writing in the same file. OK, questions? Pretty straightforward. Now, like I say, um, Unix processes have standard input, output, and error set up automatically. And almost always. The first index, index 0, is standard input. Index 1 is standard output, and uh, index 2 is standard error. Now I say almost always. When I say almost always, what I mean is if these were changed, it would break giant percentages of software that's actually out there running <laughs> in, in the universe. So um, because this has become so common that Everybody kind of always expects that descriptor 0 is going to be standard input, descriptor 1 is always going to be standard output, and so forth. Nonetheless, to be good programmers, and, I, and again, probably all of you have learned this from Mike and me over the years, you shouldn't like magic numbers. You should use these definitions so that if you ever happen to be on some planet where standard in is not descriptor 0, you know what descriptor it should be. So there's actually these definitions for various file descriptor numbers for standard input, standard output, standard error. Okay. And they're in this weirdly named header file. Uh, UNISTD means Unix standard. So it's part of the Unix standard API. OK? Make sense? All right. Let's see. Um, yeah, so <laughs> like I say, our programs really don't care where standard input and standard output go. Um, but command shells do care a lot. And this is part of, um, to me, the excitement of what you'll get to do this week in figuring out how a command shell should work. Okay? So you type something like this. I actually, I, I got to write this really cool software system for a project I did years ago, and part of it was logging what web pages were hit um, as part of um, the way, you know, the software system as it ran. And so I would write commands like this. Tell me what servers you're allowing connections to. Because I had a very rudimentary ad filter built into the system. And so, um, I would allow access and I would deny access. And so I wanted to find out what things was I actually connecting to. So I'd write commands like this. Somebody tell me what the command line arguments would actually be for grep. Does anybody know what the actual command line arguments would be for grep in this context? Just this part. Grep allow. That's all grep gets. That's all grep cares about. Because everything else is handled by the command shell. Redirecting logfile.txt in as the standard input for grep. Redirecting standard output to output.txt. Okay? So grep would get two arguments, grep and allow. 
Okay, so what we're doing is we're setting its standard input to be logfile.txt and its output goes to output.txt. Also, some of you may know the difference between a single greater than and a double greater than. Single greater than means truncate the file at the beginning. Double greater than means append. Okay, so that's another thing the command shell has to handle. So once those things are set up, grep is run and it does its magic. Okay, so it gets uh, argc of 2, argv. Now, um, I can't remember if I mentioned this last time. I never remember what I've mentioned. Um, argv will still have three elements because one of the parts of the standard is that argv will always have a null terminator. So it'll always have a field at the end of the array that's set to null. So you could just iterate until you hit um, star argv equals 0. Or <laughs> maybe not use that one. Use null, right? Um, and then you'll be okay. Uh, let's see. So this is, tends to be that they, the way that they work. Wait for a command to be entered. Okay. Like I say here, usually that's a user, but if you're writing a script or you happen to be piping something into SH or piping something into bash, then it will run the commands from the file. That's always a fun one. Tokenize the command. If the first token is an internal shell command, this is kind of an interesting one. There's certain commands you probably know this if you've done any bash scripting. Certain commands are implemented internally to the shell. They're not actually external programs. One of the fun design doc questions in the first assignment is, why is cd implemented as an internal command? Change directory. Why is exit implemented as an internal command and not a separate program? There's other things like that too. History. History is a very common one. Okay. Otherwise, for the child lock, okay? The child process is responsible for executing the program. And then, of course, the command shell is a separate process, so, um, so that we don't be confusing and have another prompt in the middle of our program output, we wait. The child process has to uh, finish before we can start running. I mean, yeah, resume receiving input is what I should say. The child process. Okay, notice I've not done any redirection yet. Because it doesn't make sense to do it in the command shell. So the child process has to figure out, am I supposed to redirect my input or output somewhere? If I am, then I should set standard input, standard output, standard error based on that. Okay. Obviously, the redirection parts are not included in the arguments to the program. Then I run the program. Now I say exec be because that's the common one that we always talk about uh, for executing another program. But I mentioned in the assignment write-up, you won't want to use that. I think it's called exec lp is the one that you want to use because that actually searches the OS's path. <laughs> you don't want to have to require people to specify the full path to a command just to run it. That gets tiring really quick. Okay? But anyway, you exec be the program, uh, passing in the arguments for the program. Okay. Um, what should happen next? Well, ideally, exec VE never returns, right? Because the program execution is successful. Okay. But if we do return, then we know something bad happened. And so this is the point where a nice, well-behaved shell, which is going to be exactly how all of yours work, will say, I couldn't run the command for some reason. And if you're really cool, then you can use the return code from the exec call and say, this is what happened. I couldn't fi find it. It's a directory, you silly. Or, you know, probably not good to curse out your user, but um, it is fun. And, uh, you know, maybe permissions are wrong or something like that. So um, this is basically where you do that. Then, of course, the child process terminates and the parent can try again. Everybody see this? Any questions? You'll probably run into questions as you implement this, and that's perfectly fine. Um, we're all happy to answer questions, and that's also why Piazza is set up. Okay. Let's see. So how does the child process output to the command shell standard output? These are interesting and useful questions to have answered. Okay. You should recall 
from CS24 that when you fork a process, it's a near identical copy. There's very little that's actually different. One of the only things that's different is it's different process ID, different parent process ID. Everything else pretty much is identical. Okay? And so the child actually also has all the same open files as the parent. And it uses that mechanism that I talked about. Array of file descriptors, and each one points to a file thingy, and those things are duplicated, and then they all point to this, the shared uh, file objects that describe the actual thing being interacted with. But like I say here, they have the exact same file descriptors. Okay. So picture child process reads standard in and writes standard out, standard error. It basically writes the same things that the command shell has. So this is what it would look like. Child process forked off. Data structures are duplicated. They point to the same things. Notice they now have their own offsets. That's perfectly fine. They can close them, and that's also perfectly fine. But they share the same backing files. OK? Questions? Yes? Uh, so is the file array kept in user space or kernel space? So the file array is kept in kernel space. Yeah, it is a per process data structure kept in kernel space. User programs are not trusted at all, guys. I mean, that's one of the things that you'll learn really quickly. In fact, I love it. In the uh, it's the uh, fourth project. Um, the tests for the fourth project are basically try to get your kernel to crash through the system call API. That's that's the fourth project. Processes are trusted very little in operating systems, in good operating systems anyway. Okay, let's see. Command redirects to a file. This is why it would be dumb to have the command shell do the I.O. redirection, because then that would affect everybody. But if you have the child process do it, then it'll work perfectly fine. Okay. Let's see, a few more things to talk about here. So child has to set up standard input, standard output, standard error. Oh, yes, question? So you point like the, some things are kernel of the process specific and some things are kernel global. You then specify like on a process, on that context, which like you change out the whole user space and then you change out parts of the kernel space and other parts are not. Oh, that is a complicated question. Um, basically, how can I say this? The kernel can always see all the processes. Because if you think about it, when you are context switching away from a process, even though you're in that process's address space, um, the kernel part of the code still needs to be able to see all the processes so it can pick the next one to run. So it'll be looking at the data structures. But in the kernel somewhere will be something that says, this is the current process running for this CPU. And so that's how it can say me versus everybody else. So all this thing is still all the process-specific data structures are like present in the kernel based array. Yeah, that. yeah, that's exactly right. You'll see a lot more. We'll, we'll flesh out that question a lot more when we get to project three and talk about how these things are managed. Yep. Okay, so we have just a few more minutes. So the final question I want to talk about is how a process changes a file descriptor. Because you'll need to know how to do that for I.O. redirection. Okay. Remember, this array um, is not in user space. So if you want to change it, you've got to ask the kernel to do it for you. There's these two very simple, unassuming looking functions called dupe and dupe2. And these uh, are system calls, and their entire job is managing that file descriptor array. Okay. So you have one, basically takes a file descriptor, gives you some random file descriptor back. It's actually not random. It's very well defined. Um, then it also refers to the same open file. Okay. Duplicates the file descriptor. Now I say a new previously unused file descriptor. There's also a constraint that it's going to be the lowest value file descriptor available. So um, if there's like you have 0, 1, 2, and then 5, 6, then it would give you 3, and then it would give you 4. Okay. You don't care about this one. This one you don't care about so much. Okay, so there you go, 3 and 4 now. Um, important is that the pointer is duplicated, not the file struct itself. Okay, so that means, for example, that if you do a read from one file descriptor, it moves the offset. That affects the offset visible through the other file descriptor. Okay, not very exciting, but um, important if you use this one. Like I said, this is not going to be the one you care about so much. So let me go ahead and hurdle on. 
This is an important detail. If you duplicate a descriptor, you need to close it because that's important for the bookkeeping that the kernel does on behalf of the process. Okay. Now, the one you really care about is dupe2 because that allows you to say what descriptor you want to duplicate into. This is the one you use to replace standard out or standard in. The neat thing is that if the second descriptor is already an open file, then it's closed before dupe2 takes over that file descriptor spot. Okay? So that basically allows you to replace a file descriptor's open file with something else. Okay? So you'd have something like this, dupe2 if the, I want to replace standard out with my file, no problem. So just to wrap this up, um, let me go ahead and show you how this would work. So we had grep allow logfile.txt. We're redirecting something into standard in. We're redirecting something to standard out. Okay. So child process. Command, uh, command shell process does not do this. If it does, it's naughty um, and it's badly written. But the child process will go ahead and execute code that does the following or something like it. Open the input file. Notice I want to open it read only because it's input, it's not output. I duplicate that file descriptor into standard in. So now I replace standard in. And then I still have to close in FD. That doesn't close this guy, it just closes this guy. Then I do the same thing with output.txt. Notice I open output.txt, I say trunk in case it already exists because that's how the greater than is supposed to behave. It's supposed to truncate the output file. I dupe to that into standard out, and then I can close my out file descriptor. What's missing from this picture? Any kind of error handling at all is what's missing from this picture. This is one of the things you'll have to build for your command shell, because I want you to write, I want you to start learning how to write solid, reliable pieces of software. Okay? So, you can check NFD, does the file exist, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can check the result of dupe2, did you succeed, um, so forth. So, you know, you'll have to get into the, the habit of that. But this code, when I see it, it like, is frighteningly naked because <laughs> it doesn't include any kind of error handling. Okay, uh, let's see, any questions? All right, let's see. So next time we'll start talk, talking about architecture. This is a fun set of lectures, so I'm excited about that. And we'll start talking more about the computer hardware interaction.